the abandoned Arab village of Lifta at the western entrance to Jerusalem. Its inhabitants fled in early 1948, following an attack by Jewish militiamen. It was to this village that the leader of the Jewish community in Palestine, David Ben-Gurion, referred in a speech on February 7, 1948, as he prophesied, in effect, the coming depopulation of the Arab parts of the country. And this is what he said. From your entry into Jerusalem through Lifta Romema, there are no strangers, and he meant, of course, Arabs. 100% Jews. Since Jerusalem's destruction in the days of the Romans, it hasn't been so Jewish as it is now. And he spoke then about the whole of the country. What had happened in Jerusalem could well happen in great parts of the country if we, that is the Jews, hold on. And if we hold on, it is very possible that in the coming six or eight or ten months of the war, there will take place great changes, and not all of them to our detriment. Certainly there will be great changes in the composition of the population of the country. People wanted to have here a Jewish state in a place where there is an Arab majority. How can you do that? There are two possibilities, or you build an apartheid, and I don't think the Zionist mentality was built for an apartheid. Or you can expel the Arabs. There is no other way. We went into Jaffa, we counted the population, and we find out that from 85,000, there were left only 3,000. Uh, they put us on trucks during the night. It was cold. We didn't take anything with us. It's a very difficult sight to see people who have to decide in two hours what to take with them, what to leave behind, whom to leave behind. Families with children, old men, women. I said, no danger for you. Stay on here in the village. We will have a Jewish state, you will have a Palestinian state, everything will be all right. They run away. It's the most difficult thing in the world to leave one's homeland, to be scattered for 50 years in other people's countries. What could be worse than this? After an exile lasting 2,000 years, Jews began to return to Palestine in the 1880s, fleeing anti-Semitic persecution in Europe. The Arabs living in Palestine resented this influx, but the British, who had conquered the land from the Turks in 1917, nurtured the Zionist movement and periodically crushed Arab resistance. By 1947, however, they had had enough, and the British government returned its mandate over Palestine to the United Nations. On November 29, 1947, the UN General Assembly voted to partition Palestine into two independent states, one Jewish, with about 55% of the land, and one Arab, with about 40%. Jerusalem was to be left as an international city. The Yishuv, or Jewish community in Palestine, numbered about 650,000. The Palestinian Arabs, about one and a quarter million. The Zionist leadership welcomed the partition resolution. The Palestinians and the Arab states rejected it, and Palestinian armed bands began to attack Jewish traffic and neighborhoods. The British announced that they would withdraw the following year, and meanwhile, hostilities between Jews and Palestinians escalated. The surrounding Arab states promised to intervene, but could not do so until the British had departed. Between December 1947 and March 1948, there were violent clashes in towns, villages, and along the roads. The Jews were far better organized, equipped, and led, while the Palestinian national movement was characterized by bitter internal feuding and disarray. Its international standing was undermined by the fact that during World War II, the Palestinian leader, Muslim cleric Haj Amin al-Husseini, had collaborated with Nazi Germany.
This is my grandson, Khalid. My name is Khalid, his name is Khalid too. This is my grandson, Mohammed Rashid. This is my granddaughter, Haifa. I named her Haifa because I love Haifa, my homeland. I gave her the name of my homeland. The battle for the city of Haifa, 100 kilometers north of Tel Aviv on the Mediterranean coast, was a major turning point in the struggle between Jews and Palestinians. The success of the Haganah, the main Jewish militia, decisively affected the remainder of the war. In November 1947, Haifa was a mixed city of about 70,000 Jews and 70,000 Arabs. It had an effective joint municipality and was well managed. Haifa was the richest and most beautiful city and the gateway to the Middle East. There was a pipeline which carried oil from Mosul in Iraq to the refinery in Haifa. There was a cement factory. Syrians used to come over to work, also Egyptians and people from other Arab countries. There was a German colony. It is called Almania to this day. There was no discrimination between the Christians, the Jews and the Muslims. All lived a very good life. As far as I remember, it was, there was no tension between Arabs and Jews at all. We lived together. Uh, many of the uh, quarters were mixed, uh, mainly on the borders. There were, of, co there were of course, uh, Jewish uh, quarters and Arab quarters, but on the borders between them, they were mixed, living in the same house. There was some tension growing up because uh, it didn't be uh, all of a sudden the, the, the decision in the United Nations. It, it, it took some time until they reached their decision. And in between, also the Arabs organized and we organized and we, we were already aware that trouble is coming and we were preparing ourselves. On the night of the partition resolution, it was a tragedy. Everybody was angry and we organized demonstrations. In the churches and the mosques, people were angry. The priest in the church refused the partition and the sheikh refused it. But the Jews were happy because they were going to have their own state. I don't think they could accept the partition plan. I don't think anybody could accept the partition plan. Of course, we can be wise now and, uh, and, uh, and uh, speak about, you know, retroactively that the Palestinians should have accepted the partition plan. This is nonsense. The Arab world could never understand why should they divide their land with the Jews. I mean, I mean you can now explain it, etc. In those years from 1939 until 1948, we had two injustices. One to the Jewish people, the Holocaust. Six millions of our people died. For what did they do? Even if we have a state at that time, they could save millions of them. We didn't have. Only because of the creation of the Palestinian issue, the Jewish question became an Arab question. It was always a European question. We don't know the Jewish question in our history. There is no such question in our history. Not more than a Christian question or an Armenian question. There is no special Jewish question in our history. It's a European issue. And I don't think any Arab would have understood why should they divide Palestine with the Jews. The other injustice was that we took away the land from the Arabs in the area. How could you build a state without land? The seven Arab states reassured us that the Jews were weaklings who could not defeat all the Arabs. They told us to hold out. They sent us weapons and we felt strong enough to resist until the Arab armies came to liberate Palestine, defeat the Jews, slay them and throw them into the sea. Between the end of 1947 and the first months of 1948, there was intermittent sniping and bomb attacks. In December 1947, Jewish terrorists killed seven Arabs with a bomb outside the gates of Haifa's oil refinery. And the Arabs retaliated by slaughtering 39 Jewish refinery workers. From then on, there were periodic clashes. The city's Arab militia was poorly trained inadequately armed and often undisciplined. By the end of March 1948, much of Haifa's Arab middle and upper class had abandoned the city. This is what we couldn't do. We didn't have a place where to go. We had to stay here because there was no place to go. For them it was very easy to go to Lebanon, to go to Shred, to go to Nazareth. 
and why should they be here and, uh, and, and, and endure all this uh, fighting which was, which started already and which they knew that it, it, it will come. In the early hours of April 21st, the British forces pulled out of the dividing line between the Arab neighborhoods downtown and the Jewish neighborhoods above them on the slopes of Mount Carmel. The Haganah decided to exploit this new situation, to gain control over the whole city, and on the same day attacked and overran several key Arab positions. We were at home, somewhere at the windows carrying weapons, defending their homes, their children, their mothers. Others took precautions, those who had gold hid it to buy food later if necessary. They uh, felt that they are in an inferior position, I would say geographically, topographically, because we sat on top of them. So it was uh, much easier for us. For instance, we used uh, drums with, filled with explosives to roll them down. The Haganah mortars peppered the Arab neighborhoods for over 24 hours. The military superiority of the Jewish forces was overwhelming, and the Arab population began to panic and flee, with their militia commanders in the lead. When the Arab defenses started crumbling, and we saw that they were disorganized, we shot some mortars in this direction in order even more to disorganize them so that they should be afraid of what is coming. And this really had this effect. Only five days earlier, the entire Arab population of Tiberias, a town by the Sea of Galilee, had panicked and fled after the defeat of their militia by the Haganah. This was the first instance of a mass Arab evacuation from a town. The Haganah commanders in Haifa were undoubtedly well aware of this precedent as their own battle unfolded. The Arabs, for their part, recalled that the Jews had massacred many of the inhabitants of a village called Dir Yassin outside Jerusalem only 10 days before, increasing their fear and panic as Haifa fell. The Battle of Haifa raged for 36 hours. As it neared its end, the commander of the British forces in the town, General Hugh Stockwell, presided over a meeting between the remaining Arab notables and the leaders of the Jewish community. The Arabs asked for a ceasefire. The Haganah demanded unconditional surrender. The notables rejected this and announced that Haifa's remaining Arab population would abandon the city completely. The Jewish mayor of the town, Shabtai Levi, appealed to the Arabs who had lived in harmony with the Jews for, or more or less harmony for the, with the Jews for, for decades, they appealed to the Arab notables not to do this, not to abandon the town. The Arab notables um, uh, again consulted among themselves and apparently uh, uh, may have been influenced by somebody from outside, but probably decided on their own um, uh, 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 to abide by their decision and to quit the town. And in fact, instructed their people, the, remain, the people who had still remained in Haifa, to leave the town, and that's when the mass exodus of Haifa began. Our commanders informed us that we had nothing left to defend ourselves with. If we stayed at home and surrendered, they would slaughter us like in Dir Yassin. We were obliged to retreat to the harbor. To the east, the English had blocked the road, and to the west, both the English and the Jews were blocking it. The only way out was the harbor. They had uh, boats, fishing boats and, uh, and, and rafts, and they went into, the, into these uh, boats and so on and started to go over the Haifa Bay to Akko. This was quite a lot of them. The English brought landing craft, and it took them a week to transfer everyone to Acre. Two to three hundred people at a time, we were transported to Acre. The evacuation by land and sea lasted for about 10 days. By early May, less than 4,000 Arabs remained in the city. Uh, I went down and it was a ghost city.
all of a sudden, they were not there. We were very, we were very, uh, we were very pleased with it. Uh, pleased that maybe it's not the, it's not the right expression. We used to stand at the harbor in Acre looking at Haifa. Looking at Haifa, we were so sad. We felt absolutely without hope. A letter to God. From the land of griefs. Date, we are still in mourning. Our Father in heaven, Lord of the universe, a thousandfold we believe in you. From the fields of suffering, these words are sent to you. From the foot of the mountains that have been starved, from the peaks whence the eagle in despair has fallen on a thorny cluster and died, from the seas which no longer have islands, only the sails of painful memory, from an embryo with its life shackled, that is all this letter is about. Our Father in heaven, O Lord, whose orphans are fed up with prayers, our Father in heaven, years it has been now and still we pray to you. Our Father in heaven, we are still starving and naked. Our Father in heaven, we are still the remains of refugees. Haifa had 70,000 Arabs, and altogether something like 700,000 Arabs fled the country or were kicked out of the country through the war. So that accounted in itself for one-tenth of the whole Arab exodus. In addition, uh, uh, these 70,000 Arabs, the departure of these 70,000 Arabs, the evacuation of this large town called Haifa, radiated fear and panic among villagers throughout the Galilee and the villagers felt well if great Haifa can't hold out against the Jews and must evacuate uh, after Jewish conquest how can we hold out and therefore they too uh, were demoralized and it helped them along in their flight later on. Israeli propaganda was later to claim that Arab radio broadcasts had instructed the Palestinians to leave their homes. In fact there is no evidence that such broadcasts were ever made. On the contrary, there are reports of Arab broadcasts from early May 1948 ordering the Palestinians to stay put. Nevertheless, after the Deir Yassin massacre a month earlier, some Arab broadcasts, by exaggerating the atrocity, indeed induced panic in the population. Jaffa was the largest Arab city and the main Arab port in Palestine. In 1947, it had a population of 75,000. The economy of the city was largely based on the cultivation and export of the famous Jaffa oranges, which grew in the surrounding groves. I was born in Jaffa in 1926. I made my studies at the Collège des Frères in Jaffa. And then in 1945, I went to Beirut for postgraduate course I studied pharmacy at the French University. I was graduated in June 1950. My father, Mikhail Khalil Tubasi, was born in Jaffa. He was the first Arab dentist in Jaffa, 1918. My grandmother had five orchards in Jaffa and Tel Aviv. She was rich. My father wasn't rich when he started his uh, private clinic, but he bought the house as I, you'll see next, 1923. He built the house in 1933. He owned the land, he bought the land, King George Avenue was called Jamal Basha Street Ottoman rule, now called Shederot Yerushalayim. He built the house in 1933, two floors and three shops. 
1947, he built another two floors. The new Jewish city of Tel Aviv bordered Jaffa to the north and to the east. According to the UN partition plan, Jaffa was to remain an Arab enclave surrounded by the territory of the Jewish state. In the wake of the November 1947 resolution, exchanges of fire erupted along the seam between the two communities. A number of Jewish militia raids and car bombs had a strong demoralizing effect on Jaffa's population, and much of the Arab elite began to abandon the city. The Arabs did agree to the partition, and on the same night, the Arabs started firing into Tel Aviv. In every tall building, they put snipers and they fired into Tel Aviv. In five months, we had lots of casualties between dead and wounded from the snipers in uh, Jaffa to Tel Aviv. And that's the reason that we decided to attack Jaffa and to stop those snipers of firing over Tel Aviv. Ben-Gurion had decided to refrain from attacking Jaffa, believing it would fall without a fight once the British had left. However, in late April 1948, Menachem Begin, the commander of the Irgun, the right-wing terrorist militia, decided to conquer Jaffa. Competing with the Haganah, he sought to win military laurels for his own organization. On April 25th, Begin's infantry assaulted the northern neighborhood while an intense mortar barrage began to pound the center of town. For three days, the infantry attack and the mortar barrage continued. At its end, the population of Jaffa began to flee southwards, the mortaring being the main factor in this exodus. On the 25th or 26th of April, the people knew in Jaffa there was no hope. Also, the massacre in Deir Yassin and some other villages made panic among the Arab Palestinians. They started preparing for immigration. The purpose of our attack, the center of Jaffa, was to hit their installations, not the, uh, the uh, citizens. The water, the electric power, and the concentrations of the Arab forces in Jaffa. When I saw refugees coming at that time to Beirut from Jaffa, so every day, every morning, I remember even at 8 o'clock, I used to be at the Beirut seaport, hoping to receive, perhaps my, father, my family also uh, was among the people coming from Jaffa, but uh, nothing happened. Uh, people saying, oh, I think your father and really, surely they left. No, nobody is staying uh, in Jaffa because bombs, mortars are falling in Jaffa. They reached the Orthodox Church and uh, uh, Butme Street. The port of Jaffa was full of people looking for any mean of transport so to run away either to Beirut or to Gaza or to Egypt. We heard that a ship, a Swedish ship, is going to come to take deportees from Jaffa to Lebanon. We took a visa to Lebanon. I can remember the queue of people in Inuz quarter, in our quarter, were more than five kilometers waiting to get a visa to go to Lebanon. The ship was overloaded. The captain, I have seen people throwing themselves from the small boat to hang with the ship to go up. The captain was so fierce and cried. He traveled away, leaving the small boats coming back. We wanted them to stay. You wanted them to stay. Yeah, we wanted to, 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 the, that they'll stay. We wanted only to fight the storm, but they had installations in Jaffa. Why would you want them to stay, the population? The Arab population, because they belong to this country. We wanted them to live in peace. 
they took me by force, my father and mother, because they said, we are living specially for you. 17 years of age, the Jews, either they will kill you or they will imprison you. This was a general feeling. The people were like in a vacuum, a fear of, and panic. But all of them, I can assure you, they had the idea that it will take two weeks, three weeks, and they will go back to their homes. That's why many people, had, when they went to Beirut and so, they went to hotels, most of them. Very few rented houses. We left Jaffa to Ramallah by convoys, 20 to 30, cars with a British army tank in front and one at the back. And on the 14th of May, we went in units of the Irgun and the Agana in a parade. I saw shops closed and then deserted streets, lots of uh, dogs and uh, cats dead. I saw nobody there. We counted the population and we find out that from 85,000 there were left only 3,000. So when you lose hope, but you still have hope that the Arab countries, the Arab regular armies will come for Syria, why not to go to Ramallah and stay for one month then we'll go back? That's a big mistake, and uh, uh, let's say we were deceived by the rulers of the Arab countries. These countries invaded in order to prove to themselves and to the, to the masses their own legitimacy, and they invaded not against Israel, but mostly against each other. Because they all suspected that the others have conspiracies with Israel. And of course, the most, the most important suspect was Abdullah and the Hashemites. The problem is that the Arab regimes at that time had a severe legitimacy problem after getting rid of colonialism. And what they were concerned about more than anything else than the Palestinian issue is giving legitimacy for their own uh, national existence as states who were created by colonialism and were not accepted by the national public opinion that the intellectuals of the 40s produced, succeeded to produce, especially in greater Syria. So Abdullah was not concerned about the Palestinian issue. The Hashemite family was concerned about its own legitimacy as a regime which was established by the Brits. The fact that the Arabs were so ununited, so uncoordinated, and acting against each other, these regimes, I mean, and so unequipped, and so uh, with such an ignorance, ignorance about, the, the, uh, uh, about how developed the Yishuv was, and how equipped it was, and how prepared it was. Um, all these reasons contributed to the fact that 49, at, at the end, the, uh, uh, was a compromise of, of defeat. It was in 1950, I got a letter via the International Red Cross informing me that there is a scheme reunion of family and that my father is working on it with a local lawyer to get me a permit to return to Jaffa. When I came in 1950, it was sure full of uh, Jewish immigrants who were here you know, in Jaffa. I met a lot of Bulgarian Jews, uh, Romanians, for all people. When I came from Beirut, I had about more than 10 keys for houses here. People gave me to see their houses, <laughs> the keys of the So my father laughed and said, you prefer much better to throw them because all the houses now are occupied by people. Our land is of honey it is told, her rivers of milk, it is told. She gave birth, it is told, to the greatest of prophets. We fell in love with her, but that love made us wretched. 
we have had to bear all the sufferings of the cross. O oh, our Father in heaven, how can you sanction that without sin as they are, your innocent children should bear all the sufferings of the cross? Our Father in heaven, we are ingenuous no more. We do not pray for your rainfall on our harvest. We do not seek cure for our wounds by spells and charms. Out of our misery, we have produced the greatest of prophets. We have made from our swelling aspiration a God who out of our dark tragedy has pointed a way to dawn. O God, pardon me if my words are inflamed. I am but a human being made of clay, destined to be sinful since the day of my creation. And you are my Lord, the infallible. The fall of Jaffa marked the end of the civil war part of the 1948 war in which the Jews of Palestine fought against the Arabs of Palestine. After the fall of Jaffa on the 14th of May, the Jews declared their state, the state of Israel, and on the 15th of May, the next day, the Arab states invaded the new country. During the following four weeks, the Israeli army contained the Arab invading armies and repelled them, and in July went over to the offensive, capturing Nazareth in the north and Lida and Ramle in the center of the country. Lida and Ramle were two Arab towns which sat astride the strategic Jerusalem-Tel Aviv road, some 20 kilometers southeast of Tel Aviv. In July 1948, each had a population of about 30,000, with thousands more, refugees from Jaffa, camped out in the surrounding areas. In early July, the command of the Israel Defense Forces, or IDF, decided to conquer Lida and Ramle as part of an effort to secure the length of the road to Jerusalem. The aim was also to neutralize a perceived threat to Tel Aviv posed by units of the Jordanian army stationed in the two towns. The attack was launched on the 9th of July. Ramle fell without a struggle, but Lida resisted. When Israeli troops took up positions in the center of Lida on July 11th, the town was still not entirely in their hands. With my platoon, I was the first to enter the built-up area of Lida. We came in from the east. There was no longer any resistance in the center of town. We raced to the center of town, where we're standing now. We came from over there, from the east. This is the town's main mosque. As far as I remember, the municipality building was here. This entire area was the market square. All around there were cafes, shops, restaurants, etc. Then it was decided to round up all the men in the courtyard of the mosque we see before us. As far as I remember, they started streaming here from about 9 or 9.30 in the evening into the mosque. There were hundreds, many hundreds, perhaps more than a thousand men. We were uh, about a uh, couple of, of thousands here, very close to each other. It was very difficult to stay there even, even for half an hour. No water, the, the weather was very hot weather, the people very afraid. And uh, when the, ma the person is very afraid and he wants to drink something, you know, and no water, nobody can go outside and to bring water. So we were removing small tins of water from hand to hand, from hand to hand. I was in the mosque. In the afternoon, the mayor came with two employees. He asked, where is the baker? Who bakes the bread for the market? They pointed at me. He said, come out and speak to the commander. I was ordered to bake bread and bring it to the compound. 
At the end, I know that the people were sent home, perhaps with the exception of some men who were detained for interrogation and so forth. It was quiet in the morning, in the 12th of July. It was Monday. And uh, suddenly, at about uh, noon, 12 o'clock, around 12 o'clock, we heard shooting all over the, the town and bombing and, and uh, explosions. We don't know what happened. We thought here that we are uh, already captured, occupied, and, and that's all. Around noon on the 12th of July, two or three Jordanian armored cars suddenly drove into Lida. A 30-minute battle with Israeli troops ensued, and the armored cars withdrew. The sound of the shooting sparked sniping by armed townspeople, who may have believed and hoped that an Arab counterattack was underway. These armored cars created a very big commotion. They fired in all directions, and it was quite dangerous. We gave a very clear order, fire upon anyone carrying weapons. Many Arabs were killed then. While we were baking, and a guard was in front of the bakery, we heard shots. The guard left, and we closed the door. We went on the hospital balcony to look from, we heard it from the other side there. We saw people running, people injured, falling on the ground, shouting and so on. Some townspeople rushed into the streets in a panic, perhaps under the impression that a massacre was underway and were cut down by Israeli fire. In the courtyard of a mosque, where unarmed Arabs were being held prisoner, scores were killed and wounded when Israeli troops opened fire. There were men detained in what is called the small mosque, several dozen, close to a hundred. A tumult began. They saw that there was shooting from all sides and tried to break out. In order to prevent this, measures were taken. I don't know exactly. Someone said a grenade, others a piat bomb, were fired into this crowd. Dozens were wounded and killed. This made it possible, together with other measures, to repress this wicked outburst. A little later I heard women screaming. I asked what happened. They said everybody in the mosque was machine gunned. By the end of the day, according to Israeli army reports, at least 250 Arabs lay dead. Israeli casualties were put at between two and four dead and 12 wounded. It happened on the second day after they entered. On the third day, we left. As the firefight unfolded in the middle of Lida, Ben-Gurion and the IDF general staff were meeting at a nearby site. The commander of the campaign, General Igal Alon, asked Ben-Gurion what should be done with the civilian population of Lida and Ramle. Ben-Gurion reportedly muttered, expel them, or in another version, merely made a sweeping gesture as if to indicate that they should be expelled. Alon promptly told his deputy, Itzhak Rabin, to order the Iftah Brigade to expel the inhabitants. The expulsion was carried out that afternoon and the next day. Tens of thousands of the inhabitants of Lida and Ramle were directed onto roads leading to the east, towards Jordanian-held territory. Go to the mountains. Everybody go to the mountains. To the village of Barfilia. They put someone in a jeep, an Arab, with a megaphone, and drove through the entire town. Do you think the town was small? Someone on one side wouldn't know what was happening on the other side. Those who heard the news would pass the word on. It's a very difficult sight to see people who have to decide in two hours what to take with them, what to leave behind, whom to leave behind. Families with children, old men and women. Soldiers lined the road all the way from the town, on one side and the other, and the people had to pass in between. 
and this was after the search. The battalion, something happened to it. The guys started to plunder. And then we assembled the entire 3rd Battalion. The commander gave a fiery speech, and everyone threw what they had taken onto one pile, and we burned it. A watch like this, they would strip from you. A ring, they would take. Women's jewelry, it would all be taken away. And they made us leave by a road three meters wide, with mud up to here. All God's creatures had to pass through it. Some had a donkey, some an ox, some a cart. The strong passed and trod on the weak. I vividly remember the image of a young woman with a basin on her head with her old mother in it, a baby in one arm, and around her five or six or seven children. Her husband perhaps wasn't alive or wasn't with her. One of the children pushed a baby carriage with a few objects and belongings, and she had to walk from here to Ramallah. When we left, we had to walk four or five kilometers at the height of summer in July. And people were thirsty. They wanted to drink, but there was no water. An old man was lying by the side of the road. He wanted water. Who would give him water? He was left there to die. Four or five people died like this. We took them to a cornfield and covered them. They died of thirst. Who would give them water? The expulsion was one of the most severe things that took place. After all, you're a Jew, a genuine Jew. You would prefer that these things not occur. But that's what happened. Traveling around Israel, one often sees clumps of cactus bushes by the roadsides or in the fields. In Hebrew, these cactuses are called sabras. In many instances, the clumps of sabras mark the spot where an Arab village existed before 1948. The villagers used them to mark out their fields. Ironically, the word Sabra means an Israeli born in Israel, and it was this generation of Israelis born in Israel who conquered the land from the Palestinians in 1948. In my case, I was lucky that in all of these villages that I um, occupied, when we came to the village, the village was empty. Of course, we, we shelled the place, we were afraid of, of the, the effect that we attacked them, we, we uh, uh, fired at the villages, but when we came to the village we couldn't see uh, anybody or here and there some old person that couldn't run away quick enough. But at one point I remember vividly the dunes north of Gaza, uh, full black with uh, all the refugees of all the villages around. There must be, I don't know, maybe 10, maybe 20,000 people there. Um, I also uh, have the memory of my own sensation, how good that they left and I didn't have to chase them. Uh, to be sure, I put a machine gun. I was then 20 years old and rather foolish like every 20 years old person. Uh, so I put a machine gun and I fired uh, towards these refugees. I mean, it was out of the range. Uh, I couldn't hit anybody. It, it wasn't a question of hitting, but it was for me. And they couldn't even hear the shots. But for me, that was kind of an action. You left, goodbye and forever. Don't come back. As the war progressed, the local leaderships in much of the country saw that after the Arab uh, evacuation, it became better. It was easier for security purposes not to have Arabs around. It was better politically not to have them around. And this um, um, seeped up to the top as well. This feeling of getting rid of the Arabs is good and uh, translated into national policy. And in June, the cabinet decided not to allow refugees to return during the war 
and uh, Ben Gurion added during that same famous session on the 16th of June, and I will try also that, that they don't return after the war. Uh, and immediately orders went out to the IDF to prevent, uh, along all the lines, the front lines, any return of refugees, including by live fire. About 400 Palestinian villages were conquered and emptied of their inhabitants in the course of the 1948 war. This depopulation occurred in different ways in different places. Some villagers fled as the IDF troops approached. Others fled when the shells began to fall on them. Still others left the villages after the IDF issued expulsion orders or used psychological pressure to force them out. In eastern Upper Galilee, there were huge villages. Salchie, which is today Kibbutz Neot Mordechai, Khalsa, today the town of Kiryat Shmona. The Arabs evacuated the entire eastern Galilee. How did it happen? We took our experts in Arab affairs. It's not pleasant to say so. Binyamin Shapira, Mano Friedman, and the people of Kfar Giladi. They went to the Arabs and said, get out as quickly as possible, otherwise there will be a catastrophe. And that's how Igal cleaned up the Galilee. Yigal Alon was a brilliant Israeli general who opposed partitioning Palestine. This translated during the war into clearing the Arab populations out of the areas which he conquered. When he marched in the Eastern Galilee and conquered it in, in uh, April, May 1948, uh, no Arabs remained. When he took Lida and Ramle in Operation Dani in July 48, no Arabs remained behind. And in Operation Yoav in October and early November 48, uh, in the south also almost no Arabs remained behind his advancing armies. And this was no doubt uh, his policy and he let his colonels and majors and captains know his will. I think it's a part of the Zionist um um, scenario of what, how things should happen. I don't think it's a plot. I don't think it's a conspiracy. I don't think, I agree with you that it wasn't a clear order, but I think it does integrate in how the Zionists mentally and psychologically looked at this land. How they wanted to look like, what they wanted here. In Hebrew, once one of them said, Karanes Vinasu. I mean, it, a, 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 a miracle happened and they escaped. I mean, it was, you know, whether it's escape or not, it was wanted to be, to happen. People wanted to have here a Jewish state in a place where there is an Arab majority. How can you do that? There are two possibilities, or you build an apartheid, and I don't think the Zionist mentality was built for an apartheid. Or you can expel the Arabs. There is no other way. I mean, I mean it's a totality. I used to live in Zakaria. We are peasants. We worked the land, planted grains, fruit and vegetables. We had a good crop because the land was fertile. The village was neither poor nor rich. I have a document which dates back 350 years. It refers to a dispute in Zakaria. My family is mentioned in this document. Zakaria was an Arab village some 25 kilometers west of Jerusalem. The Israeli attack in October 1948 was carried out in accordance with the usual pattern. The village was shelled and the troops advanced, firing as they approached. The inhabitants panicked, and most of them fled immediately. While I was walking in the street, a bomb exploded 30 to 50 meters away from me. Bombs exploded in different parts of the village. That's when the people started to abandon the village. We were afraid of being killed and of the bombs. 
We were outside the village when the Israeli army entered it. Then they came to the mountain. They took two men and slaughtered them. The Israeli army withdrew from the village shortly after occupying it. About 150 villagers who had remained hidden in the surrounding hills returned and were permitted to continue living in their homes. A little more than a year later, after the war had ended, the Israeli authorities decided to expel them. Well, I was in the winter of 1950. I was a uh, company commander in the Givati uh, Brigade. And uh, my job was to uh, take care of this area, of the entire area leading towards Jerusalem. And then at one point, uh, from my command, I, I got the orders uh, one night to come and uh, be the security over a transaction of uh, deportation. It was decided that uh, those who are left here should be evacuated. Uh, the Arabs received uh, an option either to um, uh, go to Ramle, which is inside Israel. That means they would remain Israeli citizens eventually, and, uh, but they couldn't stay here. And those who did not want to do that had to leave uh, towards Jordan, toward the Jordanian area. They put us on trucks. This was an army at war. What can you expect from an army? So hurry up, hurry up, they shouted. Our situation was bad to begin with. When they expelled us, it became worse. And uh, we connect, collected them uh, in this area where we started uh, to walk, uh, and then we put them on the truck, uh, you know, families, children, bundles, all kinds of uh, little things, and we took them, it's only the, the boundary, the armistice line is only maybe four miles away from here, at the most, maybe even less, so it was a very short ride onto the border itself, then they, we unloaded them, and they walked over and disappeared into the dark. It was at night, and it was cold. When we left the trucks, the soldiers started shooting in the air. They didn't shoot at us. So we crossed the Arab border. What we usually take into consideration when we talk about the Palestinian issue is the fact that, uh, that, is the fact that most of the refugees were peasants, etc., and that the fact that the Palestinian village was destroyed. I think we did not pay enough attention to the fact that what was really destroyed is the Palestinian city. And that after 48, we become villagers, all of us, with nostalgia to the village. Now, this has maybe uh, some um, um, uh, binding national effect, very important one, but it has also reactionary sides. Uh, the culture becomes provincial, marginal, because the, the Arab culture of between the two world wars in Cairo, Beirut, Damascus, Baghdad was produced in the city, not in the village. The modern Arab national culture was produced in the city, and we lost our city. What we became, we became margins of the cities of the others. We became margins of Beirut, we are margins of Damascus, we are margins of Amman. Do you have a, such a problem in any part of the world? We have so many refugees. Jewish refugees. In Vietnam, no, refugees as such. Polish refugees, German refugees, Czech refugees, Vietnamese refugees, Russian Viet. Are they sitting on the border 50 years for something? No, they were absorbed by the other nations. Those refugees could be absorbed by the Arab states like nothing. They didn't do anything about it. They left them to sit on the border to say how oh, you have to get back. You have to destroy Israel and back your lands. The strength of the refugee issue, it was as a humanistic issue, not as a national one. And it was clear for them that they should come back. They should return to their homes. Now, exactly becoming a national issue was against the refugee issue. Becoming a national issue, speaking about a Palestinian state, a Palestinian state be, alongside the Jewish state, now this means that the refugees are part of the national Palestinian state, which is not, which will not exist where their homes existed.
And, and this is a turning point in looking at the refugee issue. What remains, of course, in such a case, is the compensation. That's what remains. We sit here in this village. This village uh, was another village. Now it's Jewish. And uh, being a Zionist, that's what we aimed at all the time. We hoped that it might happen without the clash with Arabs. We did hope. We honestly hoped for that. But it didn't happen this way. Then it couldn't happen this way. My city collapsed. The clock was still on the wall. Our neighborhood collapsed. The clock was still on the wall. The street collapsed. The clock was still on the wall. The square collapsed. The clock was still on the wall. The house collapsed. The clock was still on the wall. The wall collapsed. The clock ticked on.